Good evening, and welcome to Moores Creek National Battlefield, site of the first decisive Patriot victory of the American Revolution. Tonight, you'll be taking a stroll along a candlelit path back to 1776. Along the way, you will encounter various living historians who will help to retell the story of the events leading up to, during, and after the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge. We hope this will be a memorable experience for you. The year is 1776, a pivotal year in American history and the birth year of our country. Yet before the Declaration of Independence was signed in July of that year, a battle would occur that would forge American independence right here in rural North Carolina. Fought between loyalists and patriots, the battle demonstrated the bitter internal division that marked the American Revolution. The stories you will hear and the people you will meet along your journey tonight will take us from being subjects of the King of England in 1775 to citizens of democracy in 1776 and onward. It appears that word has gotten out that we will no longer sit idly by and watch as our freedoms are trampled before our very eyes. In fact, we, the ladies of the colony of North Carolina, are standing up for what we believe in. We're standing with our husbands and our brothers. We, unlike the men in Boston, who dressed up in costumes and had their tea party. We are signing our names to a document. We declare this day the provincial deputies of North Carolina having resolved not to drink any more tea, nor wear any more British cloth. Many ladies of this province have determined to give a memorable proof of their patriotism and have accordingly entered into the following honorable and spirited association. I send it to you to show your fair countrywomen how zealously and faithfully American ladies follow the laudable examples of their husbands, and what opposition your ministers may expect to receive from a people thus firmly united against them. Our names are going on this document, so know that when you sign it, you are standing up against the crown. Now, my hope is to persuade you to join us to take your arguments to Royal Governor Josiah Martin and let him know where you stand. Because our names are out there, we are no longer going to hide in fear. I bid you good evening. People of North Carolina, I pledge myself to you to defend your constitutional rights afforded to you by His Majesty the King and Great Britain. I beg you, do not be misled by the, such false, seditious, and infamous reports that are designed to mislead you in believing that the Crown does not have your best interests at heart. It says right here in the latest resolutions presented to, by the House of Commons that the American colonies should be able to tax themselves. Taxation is necessary in order to provide protection for the colonies and by His Majesty's arms. With this in mind, I implore you to give the government time to pass correct legislation for taxation to ensure Great Britain and her colonies can live peacefully. Do not fall prey to the ill design of seditious and scandalous men that would have you turn on your king and the government of this colony. I ask you, the people of this province, will you now stand with me, your governor, Josiah Martin, against the seditious people who would have you form into armies against your own country, your own families, and jeopardize your rights and freedoms? If you choose to side with me, please head up river to Cross Creek to join General Donald McDonald, Donald McDonald as he raises an army to defend your rights as British citizens. If you choose otherwise, I will have no other choice than to consider you as traitors against His Majesty's government and will put forth every effort to ensure your actions are quelled against the Crown. So, the choice is yours. Good day. Welcome citizens of the province. You must be weary from your travels. Please rest. For tomorrow we have to march to meet the British Army at Brunswick Town. I am General Donald McDonald of His Majesty's Forces here in the province of North Carolina, and it is my duty as given to me by the Royal Governor Josiah Martin to repair the Royal Standard here. 
I say to you, good citizens, will you help me to deliver this province from anarchy and lawlessness? The rebels must know it's a fruitless cause, and you mustn't support any such nonsense. I plead with you, fellow Scotsmen, Englishmen, and the like, if history tells us anything, it's that the king is too powerful to wage war against. Let us fight our grievances on paper, not on the battlefield. It's better to spill ink than it is to spill blood. But if you must fight, fight with us. The time for redemption is now. Take up your swords, your rifles, your allegiances, and march for the king. How many will give up the comforts of home to help the king put down this rebellion which has failed everywhere else it's arisen? Now listen, Patriot forces lie just ahead of us at Cross Creek, and I've just received word that they plan to prevent our march to the coast. I need a messenger to deliver my response. You, please take this to the rebel commander, Colonel James Moore. Right? Thank you. This decision's hard for me to make. I don't take any pride in attacking British citizens, but Colonel Moore has left me no choice. I have to take the necessary steps to conquer and subdue these rebel forces. Hmm. Good evening, and God save the King. Colonel Moore, sir. Yeah. Dismissed. Conquer and subdue. Good people of North Carolina, do not be misled by Governor Martin or the deluded General Donald McDonald. We here in North Carolina, as British citizens, have had our rights trampled upon by Parliament and the King. I say to you, join me in this cause, and we will not only defend our rights as citizens, but this colony as well. What is it, Private? Sir, it's the Loyalists, sir. They're moving in full force towards the Black River. They've gotten around us. No matter. Make haste to Colonel Caswell. He is from and he is moving from Kingston to support us. Have him secure Corbett's Ferry along the Black River and hold the Loyalists the, uh, force there until we arrive. Sir. No time to waste. I need you to join Colonel Lillington. I must send him and the Miss Minutemen down the Cape Fear River to support Colonel Caswell. In case you are separated from Lillington, you will land at Donaldson's Landing along the Cape Fear. Head, o head north over Moores Creek Bridge and meet Lillington and Caswell at Corbett's Ferry. Make haste. We, and remember, we are now fighting for our liberty and the liberty of all mankind. Halt! Who goes there? Good God, I thought you were a Tory. You're not a Tory, right? Yes, and I can speak freely then. My name's Private John Grady. I may be a little easily startled, but this, it's as real as it gets. When Richard Caswell was marching through Duplin County, he looked at a group of young men like me and said, you, I need all able-bodied men ages 16 to 60 to march with me down to Corbett's Ferry. Well, my father was away and my mother and sisters depend on me to help look after the farm, but I couldn't pass up on an opportunity to help fight for my country. When we win this war, it'll go down in history. Patriots defeat the British Empire. Still, I can't shake the feeling that death is imminent. I know how to shoot a musket just like any other man, but in the face of battle it all seems surreal. When the time comes, I'll be on the front lines with well-trained men, unlike myself. But, uh, as I was marching, there was an older fellow who looked at me and said, If you're scared in the face of battle, just remember, you're not fighting for yourself. You're fighting for the man to the left and the right of you, to the front and the back of you. You're not just fighting for your independence, you're fighting for all our sakes. We've let the king look down on us like we're servants to make the economy boom for far too long. How long will you let this affect your everyday life? Men, grab your guns, tell your wife and children goodbye, and join us in the Patriot cause. Now is the time to make a stand here at Morris Creek. 
Will you join me? Good. So be it. Find a place for the night. You'll need your rest. Ah, there you are! I'm Alexander Lillington, at your service. You've been assigned to me by Colonel Jim Moore. A lot has happened since we last met on the banks of the Cape Fear. It seems that old sly Fox Doll McDonald has chased Caswell over Corbett's Ferry, and now he has to retreat south to here at Moore's Creek Bridge. This is where we plan to take our stand. All day we have been building earthworks on this side of the bridge. We have also pulled the planks off of Widow Moores Creek Bridge to slow the advance of the enemy should they try to come this way. Earlier this afternoon, we had a messenger come over, a loyalist messenger, and he told us that we needed to surrender our weapons and disband. Caswell gave him a very adamant rejection. As you can see, we're nearly a thousand strong. If they are going to rendezvous at Brunswick Town, they have to get through us first. Hey, listen. I need some reconnaissance on the enemy side. And since you're heading that way, it's only about five miles from here. Please, give me any information that you might find. Oh, and be careful. If you're caught, you will be treated as a traitor to the crown. You there, quiet down. There's no way to sneak into an enemy encampment. I heard you from nearly a mile away. Listen now. The messenger came into the encampment last night, told General, McDon General Donald McDonald where the enemy encampment was, how many men were there, and where the bridge was. He's too sick, so he's turned command over to me, Lieutenant Colonel McLeod. The plan is to head to the coast, meet up with the British forces there, just below Wilmington, a place called Brunswick Town. With you, it makes nearly 1,600 strong. I have men searching the encampment now. Sir, the camp is deserted. All right, search for the bridge. I Who goes there? A friend. A friend of whom? Friend of the king. Men, it's the patriots. Draw your swords. Use them to steady yourself across the beams. Cross this bridge. <laughs> Men, we're finally across the bridge. We're now a hundred strong. Let's get these rebels. King George and broadswords! Make ready. Present. Get fire. Hold your fire, men. Well, you must be the soldiers that Lillington sent out on patrol. I thank you for your service, but we have already encountered the Tories as they have charged across the bridge the most furious manner. <clears throat> they retreated, though, back across the bridge because our cannons kept them from getting to this position. Their numbers were large, though, nearly as many as ours, but many of them were just carrying nothing more than swords, which meant they were no match for our burst of musket and cannon fire. Mother Covington, she did good today, booming her disapproval of the Tory charge. <clears throat> We've counted nearly 30 loyalists dead, 
And who knows how many have drowned in the swamps or laying in the woods wounded. This is a great victory. We may very well have prevented a full-scale invasion of this colony. Unfortunately, we have had one casualty. One from militia that I recruited in Duplin County when Private John Grady was wounded in the battle. I blame myself mostly. I knew those militia men were not as well trained as my Minutemen. If only he had been better prepared. Unfortunately, the doctor said he's most likely not to make it through the night. He was, John Grady is a brave man. Should you see his kinfolk, please pass on the good news of the battle and his brave, brave fight and my deepest condolences. He will be remembered as a hero to this new great nation. And if he should perish, he shall be the first in North, from North Carolina to do so for our freedoms. Now carry on. We must be off to capture the fleeing Tories, but watch yourself so as not to fall prey to capture. This cannot be so. John barely gave me a hug as he ran out the door. Colonel Caswell and his men were on their march. And John said he couldn't just sit at home and watch his cousins and his friends fight for him. I barely got a hug as he went out the door. When he came in to get his musket, I held him like a mother would. Elizabeth and Charity and Mary, his sisters, were all begging him not to go. And you're his father. He was he was supposed to help with the farm when you went to service. He left with such pride and patriotism. Colonel Caswell himself asked him to join him on the march to Morse Creek. My firstborn, my patriot, has given his life, and for what are we yet free? And you must speak like that. I'm so proud. He came and done that because our, so our families can have the freedom that we come here for. I'm proud of his sacrifices. Caswell said he was the first from North Carolina to die for this cause. I pray he's a last, but I fear he won't be. Let us honor his life. These two blue lights signify the two patriots who were wounded in battle. Utterly, my son died for his wounds. Let these two lights signify the sacrifices these two and many others have and will do. Honor them with commitment to freedom. And please, don't forget my son, Private John Grady of Duplin County. Good evening. Greetings. I am Flora McDonald. You may wonder what the 75 red luminaries are. I will tell you. They represent the 75 brave men who joined forces with approximately 2,000 men at Cross Creek. It was about a month ago and they were rallying around the Royal Standard. These 75 men paid the ultimate price for their king and their country. If I could go back to that time, I rode through the ranks and I was encouraging the men to stand strong and I was trying to summon them to see it through. And if I had the chance, I would do it again. Why, you ask? When myself and the other loyalists of King George III, uh, we gained nothing from it except a, a tremendous loss. Well, not everyone has a choice. 
when I came to this country, when my family came, we swore an oath of allegiance that we would never raise arms against the king's men. Our oath is our bond. Whether standing or dying in the face of the rebel cause, I know that my fellow countrymen were brave and stood strong. These 75 souls were as brave as the thousands that perished at Culloden in 1745. What we were fighting for was not just liberty and freedom, but it was for honor. I believe our Scotsmen and fellow British citizens honored their forefathers today. I stand here this evening in the cold, in the dark, and I've lost a husband and a son, not to death, but to prison, and that may be a death sentence. I do hope to see them someday soon, and when that time comes, we will leave this wretched place. I can't make an oath. I shall not make an oath of allegiance to the rebel cause. No. I shall return home to Scotland with my family. And I hope your cause, whether patriot or loyalist, has turned out better than my own. See to it that no matter what government you live under, you honor yourself, you honor your word, you honor your heritage. Take care on this dark and solemn night. Dear Diary, my husband left Sunday morning. Him and more than 80 men left from our house. They got off in high spirits, with every man stepping high in light. Slept soundly that first night and worked hard throughout the day, but I kept thinking where they had got to. How many Tories or regulars would they have met? I couldn't keep myself from the study. Although I went to bed at the usual time, I continued to study. I lay, whether waking or sleeping, I don't know. I had a dream, but it wasn't a dream at all. I saw distinctly a body wrapped in my husband's guard cloak. Bloody, dead others dead and wounded on the ground around him. I saw them plainly, distinctly. I uttered a cry and sprang. Jumping to the floor, I, I never felt such fear as in that moment. Seated on the bed, I reflected a few moments and said aloud, I must go to him. I told the woman I couldn't sleep and would ride down the road. Oh, she was alarmed, but I told her to watch the child. I went into the stable and saddled my mare. And in a minute, we were tearing down the road. We rode at full speed. We followed the well-marked trail of the troops. The blind path I'd been following brought me into the Wilmington Road, leading to Moores Creek Bridge, a few hundred yards below the bridge, a few yards from the road, under a cluster of trees, lying perhaps 20 men Hmm. I had seen it before. I had seen it all that night. I saw it all at once, but in an instant my whole soul was centered in one spot. For there, wrapped in his bloody guard cloak, was my husband's body. Washing his face with a damp rag, I could make out his brave soldier. No, not my Ezekiel. After many hours tended to the wounded, I heard a familiar voice. That of Ezekiel's. Standing there, bloody, muddy. I leaped into his arms at the sight of his unarmed presence. I stayed throughout the day to finish helping with the wounded and at nightfall mounted my horse and began the 60 mile journey home. 
What a relief to know, at least for now, that Ezekiel was safe. A woman's role in the revolution cannot be understated. Like many, I have followed their husbands, brothers, and sons into battle to provide service to the militia. Others stayed at home to take care of the family, tend to farms and businesses, and provide safety on the home front. Each of us has to do our part in supporting the cause for freedom. Each of us has something to offer such a noble cause.